<clears throat> so good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to this edition of the NITEX Colloquium. Uh, my name is Francesco Petruccione. I'm the director of, uh, of NITEX. And this afternoon, it's a great, great pleasure to introduce you to you, Professor Guy Mitchley. Explain to me what the F in his initial means, but I won't repeat it, yeah, because we are online. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe later. Yeah. Franklin. And uh, the guy <clears throat> spent his uh, uh, academic life study ecosystem and uh, climate change. Yeah, and it's very appropriate that we are here today to to sort of celebrate this uh, book that was published uh, recently. <clears throat> so I don't have to read the the title. <clears throat> Yeah, maybe a few sentences to the bio of, of Guy. Guy <clears throat> started his career, academic career, at the Botanical Research Institute, which is now Sunby, and since 2004, 2014, he's professor at the Stellenbosch <clears throat> University. <clears throat> More recently, he became the director of the School of Climate Studies um, and having been previously the director of the Center for Invasion Biology. So covered all the, all the bases of what we are talking about today. And <clears throat> since you're here to listen to Guy and not to me, Guy, please, you're most than welcome to start your, your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francesca. I suspect, uh, shall I wait for the sound to be sorted out? No, I, I, I'm... Okay. It, it was on at one point. Yes, it's, well, how's that? One, two, three, four, five, six. No, not yet. Oh, a few people still coming in, so that's good. <clears throat> this little light is on. Johan, didn't you mute something here? You muted the audio. Okay. You muted the audio. Is that the problem? How's that? Yes. Okay. Oh, that's perfect. Marvelous. Okay. Thank you very much, Francesca. Thanks to the NITEX team for giving us a platform to tell everybody about uh, this book that uh, some of us have been involved with. Um, we, I, I'm not 100% sure who on the invitation list has, has made it here, but uh, in the event that somebody very important has made it to the online event, can I welcome Verena Stockicht, who is Head of Environmental Affairs, Climate Action and Consumer Protection at the Embassy of Germany. And the reason... Uh, she's here is because a huge amount of funding was made available by the German BMBF to Southern Africa over the course of about a decade to fund the research that is being summarized in this book. I think it's something to the tune of 40 to 60 million euros was pumped into, <coughs> I shouldn't say pumped into, was invested wisely <coughs> into 10 scientific teams with membership in Germany and in Southern Africa. And I'll tell you about the program. But over the course of 10 years, this program produced, I think, some incredibly good science and investigated a lot of very, very important questions which were not being tackled in the region. So this is a very welcome investment. And I do hope I've been lobbying for several years now, more than two, to try to persuade <clears throat> the German 
Bundestag to possibly invest a little bit more because a few thousand, few tens of thousands of euros, even a few million euros, goes an awfully long way in this part of the world. And we built up some really good teams who are still roughly in place, even two years later, who could, who could pick up the reins again. But let me move from that, and, and please may I welcome any other dignitaries who invited, um, all protocols observed, and you, you know, you're very welcome here today. We, how did this book come about? <clears throat> well, I'm sure many of you remember the COVID episode, and COVID hit us just at the time when we were embarking on the final two years of the fieldwork for our program. <coughs> Excuse me. And that really put a spanner in the works of our collaboration. Um, so this gentleman, Mike Vester, suggested to everybody, why don't we write a book? on all the work that we've done. Let's use, let's redirect some of those funds into a book that summarizes the last 10 years of our research. And so we did. We started to, to put it together. This young man, Graham von Maltitz, was one of our main drivers. And he's so uh, incredibly well organized and he helped us put things together. Uh, this guy was a bit of a passenger. <clears throat> and then everybody else threw their weight in. We've got many, many people to thank, including the, um, the reviewers of the chapters. But let, let me move on. There's a lot I want to get through. So let's, uh, let's move on. Right, so the book's called Sustainability of Southern African Ecosystems Under Global Change. It's 1,000 pages plus. It's quite well-shaped. If you need a, a weapon of some kind, after hearing the news from from North America uh, to in, you know, reduce stress, but uh, it's it's a really and I want to say that Spaces and the program funded it to thanks Ashley funded it to the to the level that we are able to download this entire book for free. It is open access. Over 30 chapters. I'm going to go through them, every single one in detail. Don't worry, I'm not going to do that. But the subtitle is Science for Management and Policy Interventions. And I'll try to <laughs> show you how some regular scientists have, have tried to engage in that. Let's move. Uh, here's a really nice forward by uh, the Minister of Research and Education who was um, responsible for at least part of the time where we got the funding, and in fact visited us here in Cape Town a couple of times and in South Africa a couple of times. And uh, yes, once more, thanks to, to Germany for this very welcome funding. We also have a, a forward by Johan Po, whoops, who is ex-director of the South African Environmental Observation Network, and he's written a lovely forward. And um, our work is linked quite closely with what Seon has been doing. We also want to thank Mari Beery, who was the coordinator of the entire program from Tunin University. Mari was incredible throughout the whole course of the program. She arranged trips to South Africa with many, many people. And she really helped us drive the development of this book. So I want to acknowledge her and then a number of people we've, we've acknowledged there. The program, as I said, was called Spaces, Science Partnerships for Adaptation to Complex Earth System Processes in Southern Africa. Quite a nice acronym. Now, <clears throat> this book, contains an enormous amount of new information. Enormous. It's nearly a thousand pages. Okay, for quite a few pages of references. Let's say at least 800 pages of content. And I want to quickly 
just very, very quickly give you an, an indication of the, the chapter titles. So there are 32 chapters. I'm going to run through them quickly. We start with uh, this introduction on coupled earth system and human processes. We have a chapter on unique Southern African terrestrial and ocean biomes, where we put these together in the, in the chapter for, yeah, not the first time, but it's a, it's a, good, it's a good effort. Environmental challenges to meeting SDGs, an overview of the macroeconomic drivers of the region. You can see how we're really shifting between disciplines here. And then in part two, which is about drivers of variability and change, we look at past climate variability, Southern African trends over recent decades, projections into the future, which I've got some graphs to show you, just so you can update your knowledge in the aftermath of the US election which is requiring us to, to readjust. Uh, some excellent chapters, I mean really amazing chapters, on the Agaros current system and the Benguela. And then a chapter on regional land atmosphere interactions. This is a fun book, guys. This is great. I mean, this is, you can't put this thing down. Uh, I've many times upset my wife by being delved into this book in the evenings. Studies of the ecology of Benguela, another Benguela um, paleo-environmental research, soil erosion. There's a chapter on soil erosion, very interesting. Biome changes in Southern Africa on the land surface, cutting-edge science, much of it developed here in Africa. Biodiversity and ecosystem functioning in savanna rangelands, managing South African rangeland systems, Southern African. Uh, carbon sources and sinks, interesting chapter on how ecosystems are absorbing and releasing CO2 and how we can manage for that. Trends and barriers for wildlife-based options. There's some really applied agricultural um, chapters. And yeah, it carries on. Improved technologies to enhance land management, macadamia orchards. Then part four is about monitoring and modeling tools, a new era of earth observation. Very interesting introduction to what's now becoming available to detect land degradation. The marine carbon footprint, Benguela. Dynamics and drivers of NPP in terrestrial systems, also brand new um, science. Um, metal enrichment of sediments. You can see very, very multidisciplinary. Catchment of depositional studies using paleo-environmental change, fascinating chapter. Observational support for regional policy implementation, also magnificent uh, chapter. And then to get to, yes, go forward, uh, press the wrong button. And then part five, the synthesis and the outlook. We talk about research infrastructures and what we've learned. We've got a really fascinating chapter on lessons learned from North-South Science Partnerships, where we track scientists who were involved at different institutions, how their networks developed, how their careers developed, who benefited. And we also polled them using uh, opinion, opinion, uh, opinion polling. We, we, we sent out questionnaires and got their opinions, which we've summarized in this chapter. And then a synthesis and outlook on future research and scientific education in Southern Africa. Okay, 32 chapters, <coughs> packed full of amazing stuff. And I'm just going to highlight, you know, how, we, how much time do I have? Another five? Oh, wow. No, I'll finish before then, I hope. Okay, we need time for questions too. I don't know. Oh, yeah, including questions. Oh, my gosh. Okay, cool. I want to leave time for questions. Right. So let's, uh, let, let's just quickly look at <coughs> some of the content. Um, this, uh, this, this figure in chapter one, really sketches the background of the funding and the kind of information that we brought into, into the program, the legacy data, where it came from, the history, how it fitted in with South Africa's capacity building and the Global Change Grand Challenge. And then we, uh, we looked at how all these elements can be used to shift to implementation and management, and particularly looking at this conservation versus development debate. Um, and, you know, most of the chapters cover these sorts of issues. 
the marine area, the terrestrial area are somewhat parallel, not precisely parallel, and then there are these areas that, that link between the two of them. Overall processes at the, at the higher level, carbon cycles and, and impact. Now, I remember developing that, that figure. Um, not far from here. So let's look at this chapter. The Southern African Terrestrial and Oceanic Biomes and the critical issue of steep environmental gradients. What is one of the most important advantages of doing this kind of work here? Yeah. It's a, it's a really important part of the world because we have very steep climatic and other gradients operating in the oceans and on the land, which we can use as natural experiments to understand how these systems operate because you, could, you, know, you can use space for time substitution. Along the oceans, we've got this warm current, the cold Benguela upwelling. We've got the Mozambique with its eddies. All these things affect climate, they affect fisheries, they affect management, and they interact with the land surface, and the land surface it interacts with them. On land, we have incredible gradients uh, from the southwestern Cape to the northeastern, aridity, temperature gradient, and seasonality gradient, and so we move with quite well-defined borders across different biomes, and that's a marvelous natural experiment to use. It's also a great way to observe change because you'd predict that you would see changes due to climate, due to CO2 or whatever, at the edges of these biomes. So this is another fantastic natural experimental setup that we can use. Just to show you one of these amazing gradients that we have available to us, just north of us, we can go from a very high rainfall area just here in Yonkers Hook of several thousand meters, uh, millimeters of rainfall a year to a hyper-arid desert within a space of a few hundred kilometers. It's one of, the steepest, one of the steepest rainfall gradients in the world. It's quite, uh, it's quite phenomenal. Uh, jump, what? Are we going backwards? Or? I was pressing the wrong thing. I'm so sorry. All right. So that is the, um, these are the gradients that we can, we can use. And it really makes the argument as to why investment in this region in ecosystem research is so valuable. And this chapter deals with you know, the, the terrestrial diversity and diversity of biomes, and also some beautiful new work, new samples that have been taken in the ocean, and these amazing photographs. For those of you who like just nature, it's, there's some great content there, as well as the scientific content as well. Uh, and as I said, we try to start to introduce this concept of how do the land and the ocean interact. We have evidence of... of wind dust plumes blowing off the land surface, possibly enhanced by land use change, warming, drought, and that leads to fertilization of the ocean's primary production systems in the area of, of this offshore. And it can, change bi it can change biology. Similarly, fog and onshore movement of nutrients brings nutrients onto the land uh, to different distances. So, these areas are, are, are places where the land and the ocean interact very, very strongly. Very challenging to model, but what an opportunity to model them. And it's so important to do the modeling because we're considering options like generating green hydrogen along this coast. What are we going to do with the, with the brine? If you push the brine into the Benguela, does it blow apart that system? What are the risks? These are critical questions coming out of this area. It's a very high solar radiation area, so you can generate lots of solar energy. But if you desalinate seawater at, at, uh, at will, you can, you can end up with a real problem. Okay, those sorts of problems, or those sorts of challenges. Chapter two, uh, chapter three is an exclusively South Afri Southern African written chapter, and it places the, uh, the work that we've done in an SDG framework and very specifically looks at African problems. Uh, and for example, the, one of the big problems that we have is not a deforestation problem, although we do have deforestation issues. We have an afforestation problem driven, we think, partly at least by rising atmospheric CO2, which is fertilizing plant growth. So we see these big greening trends across the subcontinent that has huge effects on biodiversity. It chokes up grasslands with shrubs. 
It destroys people's livelihoods. They cannot graze their cattle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It, it causes the potentially the increased use of water. This is not a standard northern hemisphere challenge. It is our challenge, and we need to do our science to address it and develop our own models. That is why this funding has been so very welcome. Not only the funding, <coughs> but the collaboration with German scientists who are world leaders in, in many of these areas. Macroeconomic drivers, fascinating little chapter. I'm not doing this for every chapter. I'm just I'm going to be picking out fewer and fewer as we go along. Um, <coughs> look at this. The composition of GDP in Southern Africa and selected Southern African economies. Uh, we see you know, this is the socioeconomic context for our region. South Africa's GDP, I mean, we're a giant in the area, but there are other economies that are emerging and growing. Who's, who's big in agriculture? Mozambique, the biggest proportion of GDP is from agriculture. South Africa is only 2.1%. It can be misleading, though, because you, you're missing out the, uh, the additional value chains from agriculture, but just the raw uh, issue there. Um, but you know, we in Botswana are very low in direct agricultural GDP. Look at mining, still extremely high in Botswana, <clears throat> down to 12.2% in South Africa. And so the shifting patterns across the different areas of, of Southern Africa's economy, super, super important to have as a context as we study the future. Now, let's get on to climate. This is fascinating because we've got a lot of new information stuck away in this chapter. Firstly, chapter five, and I, I know it's chapter five because the figures are numbered five, so I don't need to keep on giving you the chapter <laughs> numbers all the time. But look at this amazing graph. This is a reconstruction of South Afri Southern African rainfall over the past 500 years in the winter rainfall zone who, who believed that we had rainfall, you know, we could do this back to 1550? Extraordinary. And look at this. The 50, middle 1500s, rainfall was a fair amount higher than it is now. So, um, and you see these, these, the cyclicity that goes on, decadal, multi-decadal. This is a region that is driven by Climate cycles and a, you know, an overfocus purely on climate change is leaving us vulnerable because we don't understand what's driving these cycles well enough. And this is what leads to a lot of our problems. Droughts and floods are, are very often related to cycles in, exacerbated by global warming. This is the a reconstruction back, back to 800 AD of uh, near surface mean air temperature relative to the 20, 20th century. And look how much cooler it was. You go back to 1800, there was a real cold spell. That's probably, um, I think that's Pinatubo. I think it's a Pinatubo eruption. Might be Krakatoa. I'm not, I can't quite remember. But that's a volcanic eruption. These are volcanic eruptions that drive these cooling events mainly. Um, but look how cold it was. And then you know, a little bit of warming here in the medieval warm period. But generally, the Southern African, according to these reconstructions, Southern Africa has been a lot cooler then even the 20th century, and now we're putting warming trends on top of uh, warming trends already happen. What's, what's been happening to rainfall change and what can we say about it? Notoriously difficult to be able to say things about historic rainfall change, and that limits our ability to make policy. But here is a really good reconstruction of rainfall trends in the summer and winter rainfall areas by two modeling approaches, and it shows how there's been a wetting trend in the summer rainfall area over the central part of sub-Saharan Africa. Not true today, though. We've got a drought there right now, so that shows you the importance of these cycles. And people are, are struggling here. But in, if you look at the long-term trend from 1979 to 2020, that's right. Okay, so that gives you a sense, and these are the, the temperature trends um, showing these little hot spots of warming uh, reconstructed from data and using models. And using Western Cape in winter, quite a strong warming signal. Oh, sorry, that's Western Cape summer. Western Cape winter, not so bad. But look at Namibia, Southern Angola. All the hot spots start to pop out. You, know, you must admit, it's a lot of really fine-grained new information here. What's happening into the future? 
Francois Engelbrecht from ACDI, uh, from GCI at WITS, has been doing a lot of modeling, he used to be at CSIR, and his models, uh, he's really interestingly related rainfall change predictions to the amount of warming predicted. So if two degrees of global warming, this is roughly what he predicts is going to happen. Four degrees of global warming, these brown areas are losses of rainfall of 40% or more. So if we allow the world to warm to four degrees, the Republican agenda, drill, baby, drill, um, burn fossil fuel, comes true, four degrees of global warming is hugely on the cards. And that would be devastating for this region when we reach that point. How much, you can, how much risk can you avoid by sticking to one and a half? Massive amount of risk. That's why we've got to fight so hard in the negotiating rooms to protect our climate. And this is the science that helps us to make those arguments, for, uh, folks. If we let the world warm to four degrees, central southern Africa will warm well beyond four degrees. It could warm up to five, six degrees because a four degree global takes into account ocean warming, which is less. So on average, land tends to warm more. And this would be absolutely critically devastating for our region. That's what we face, folks. It's what you face now. We really, we, we face it now because these guys have got the reins of power. They're there. They've got the White House, they've got the House, they've got the Senate, they've got the Supreme Court, everything. It's a clean sweep. Um, I think it's a clean sweep. I'm not sure about the House. I'd be surprised if the Dems get the House. Um, projected changes, this is really interesting. Projected changes in heat wave days over Southern Africa with a three degree global warming. Three degrees global warming, most IPCC scientists suspect that we, we could get to three. I think almost a majority do, despite the fact that we're fighting like crazy to keep below one, below two. But if we got a three degree warming, the number of heat wave days over Botswana, southern Angola, Namibia would increase by 40 per year. 40 heat wave days per year. That would eliminate a large range of the small bodied bats and birds in this area. These animals are already falling out of the sky in January this year under a heat wave that exceeded, I think, 35 degrees for about three days. We had a mass mortality at Swalu in the Kalahari, driven by that heat wave event. This is going to drive massive numbers of birds, at least birds, out of this area. That's the risk. That's the risk that these politicians, they, they, it's in their hands. All right. Zonal winds. Okay, this is very interesting. Just, I'm going to pick out some interesting little connections between land and, and sea. The, the zonal winds projected into the future, driven by different emission scenarios, greenhouse gases, these are the most likely, which leads to changes in the way the Agaras current leaks warm water into the Benguela. And this increasing uh, pattern tends to affect rainfall over Central Africa. So how much energy flows into the Atlantic and north, uh, northwards towards the Northern Hemisphere has implications. This is, this is a historic, uh, a historic um, correlation between a gunnus leakage and historically observed rainfall change and what's projected further change. So drying and wetting driven by changing a gunnus leakage. This is a land, an ocean land interaction that changes our regional climate. We're just starting to unpick and uncover all these linkages, all the science. Yeah? You think scientists are, are just following their, their noses, doing interesting stuff. Of course we're doing that, but it's also valuable. And you need to be incentivized to do this stuff. It's really hard work. So you know, it needs to be interesting. You need a certain you know, kind of brain to be interested in this sort of thing. It's tough. <laughs> But uh, I think this is amazing. It's very, very interesting work. And this team has been doing leading edge work here. Um, some other observed changes in the Benguela. Shifts in uh, ocean temperature, showing observed 
trends in sea surface temperatures and oxygen, oxygen dropping, oxygen rising, um, very interesting patterns that affect sea life in many, many ways. And then the shoaling or the um, upward and downward movement of the stratification, that's the layer between the cold, uh, warm surface water and the cold lower water. The, the position of that interface affects a lot of physical behavior and biological behavior. And you can see that this is uh, going deeper here. Now, hang on. It's going deeper here, and it's getting shallower here off the coast of, of, of Angola and further north. What, are, what happens because of these things? And here we, we have a team that linked these sorts of changes in chapter 11, uh, all the way from uh, yeah, chapter 11, to what might happen to the ecosystems, which not only drive the sustainability of these systems, but also drive human life, because we fish these systems in a big way. And this chapter looks at three different scenarios of what might happen to food webs. Rich uh, um, information here. Really, I, I, I appeal to lecturers to read this book and incorporate whatever they see as valuable into their lectures because we have moved a lot of the science forward. In very, there's a heck of a lot of work that's gone in here. Ocean cruises, ship observations, land observations. It's, it's, it's as, yeah, 40 million euros worth, maybe 60 million euros, euros worth of work that we should benefit from. On land, we've done a similar thing where we've looked at um, terrestrial changes and then made some projections of different scenarios. So we're taking the basic science and pushing it into something that we can use for policy making, for implementation, for guiding decisions. Soil erosion research and soil conservation. This is not a pretty picture. The bottom line of this chapter is that the processes of soil formation take an awfully long time, two to three orders of magnitude longer than the observed rates of erosion. So um, we are degrading, the latest information suggests we're degrading our, our soil resource, and it takes a long time to recover that. Biome shifts, what's going to happen to our biomes? Yes, so we just picked out one graph showing changes in biomes projected not only because of temperature and rainfall, but also rising CO2. And you can see how all these colored dots represent a shift in biome, a change in vegetation structure. And here, these, these purple ones mean that we are switching to, from a grassland to a savanna. We're, we're seeing bush encroachment. I told you about the greening trends. This suggests that these, you can model these into the future. They get much worse under a higher emission scenario. But more importantly, we observe this happening. It's already started to happen. CO2 has been rising for a century already. And we can see these effects. We can model these effects, build into those models projections. This is not just theoretical model. It's a model based on actual observations, which we have combined to develop models. So uh, we go far beyond just theoretical work. Um, another really interesting uh, kind of modeling, which we conceptualized I think I remember just conceptualizing this in about 2011 in Middleburg in the Eastern Cape when we had one of our first spaces meetings. And we started to talk about, wouldn't it be amazing to be able to link all these drivers with strong mechanistic models, CO2, livestock, ecosystem service, everything, threats into a, a, a policy-relevant modeling system. And these authors, uh, most of them, many of them at uh, Tunen, uh, sorry, Zinkenberg in, uh, in Germany, but also South Africans, uh, sorry, Africans, actually South African, um, were involved. And we now have this capability. So we now have an ability to, to build observation, experimentation, and modeling into a self-reinforcing cycle of what I'm going to call scientific excellence for policy making. What a brilliant legacy to have left for our region that this funding has created. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. 
They would be so cheap to carry on for anybody listening. Back in Germany, I know you've got a lot of problems. But in terms of leverage, man, we're spending money on all sorts of things here in this region. We want to look at you know, telescopes, looking at the stars. It's expensive. We can achieve very similar outcomes, maths, physics, science, modeling, like this, and result in something incredibly useful for tomorrow and the next day, not whether or not a black hole is about to close up and collapse somewhere 75 million light years away and prove somebody's theory right or wrong. Yay. Sorry, I don't mean to dismiss it, but it is a lot of money going in that direction. I've, I'm probably going to get fired after this. All right. <laughs> Guys, I'm about to retire in a few years, so it's fine. I, I will be your voice. Right. A fine line between carbon source and sink. This is a great chapter. Um, you hear Daily Maverick. Don't quote me on that. Um, a fine line between... So, so here's another great um, opportunity in our region. We have systems that are able to monitor... CO2 and water vapor movement on a minute-by-minute -minute basis out of some of our ecosystems. And using these systems, this, these are German systems that were employed at, at Middleburg, we found that we can detect the effect of different land use. So different levels, different intensities of sheep grazing, uh, we can detect in the form of greater carbon fixation in a lighter grazed ecosystem. And that's revealed by this line here, showing year after year, started monitoring in 2016. These systems cost about a million and a half rand each to install, a few hundred thousand to run every year. Seon does a lot of them. And these are giving us insight into how our ecosystems are functioning. And it shows that the lightly grazed system can continuously absorb carbon and sequester carbon. Uh, these are wet and dry years, and you can see the, the sink strength goes up and down. What an amazing finding. We can, we, we can convert this into real policy guidance. And uh, we have a chapter on research infrastructures as anchor points for long-term environmental observation that builds on this idea and links into the phenomenal work that the NRF and the DSI have funded into land surface functioning observations. This is valuable, valuable investment that our negotiators can use in the climate change halls of battle, where we need them desperately. Um, wow, this is chapter 32. We're at the end. Perfect. This is a little, a little chapter that just try to pull all this information together. And uh, yeah, there's a heck of a lot more than I talked about. And really, uh, we try to conceptualize some potential frameworks that we could use in a next phase of this kind of research, leveraging all our momentum, all the skills, all the equipment, all the, all the new skills that we've trained. I mean, we've trained a lot of scientists in this region who are, who are looking for work, and we don't want to lose them to the rest of the world. We want to keep them here. It's, uh, it's extraordinary. Um, and then these, this, this whole area of model-based option identification using stakeholder involvement, that, that, that uh, figure I, I, I showed you earlier, a bit more formalized. So where are we? Yeah, we woke up on Wednesday, and this graph took on a different meaning. Because we've always hoped that we would avoid a significant overshoot by 2050 and start to will, cool the world down again. And I've always joked that yeah, this is Trump world. This is Ted Cruz world. This is uh, Robert's Supreme Court world, etc. It's a Republican world. This is, this is a world that we may have said goodbye to. And our overshoot may do something like this. We may well warm the world up and take a very, very long time to cool it back down. And here we have enormous risk for our region, as this work has demonstrated. We risk losing valuable and incredible species 
and millions and millions of years of evolution. This guy's already on the brink of extinction. Tourists come to look at penguins, African penguins, all the time, little knowing that this, this species is literally hanging on for survival by the skin of its, they don't have teeth, the skin of its beak. And these guys are wilting under, on the west coast. But there is some hope. Demographically, the world is slowing down. We, we've got a lot of people on the planet, but human population growth rate peaked in the 1950s and has plummeted since then. So there is light at the end of the tunnel. It isn't going to go on forever. Um, those are real data. And as we all know, some countries have very, very low fertility rates. China, extraordinarily low. North America, Australia. Africa's fertility rate is still pretty high, but they are dropping fast. And look at South Africa. So there is light at the end of the tunnel. This kind of work has got value, can help our negotiators. It can help train new skills. It can help retain scientists in our region. It can build regional collaboration. It can help to save the world because we've got some of the biggest carbon sinks in the Southern Ocean and in Southern Africa. So we can help to save the world. They just need to fund us a little bit more. Globally, Africa gets less than 3% of the funding allocated to climate change research. Less than 3%. And half of that goes to international scientists working in Africa. So African science get less than 1.5% of the global investment in climate change science. And this investment, you can see what an incredible return on investment this gives. So we're not a bad investment. We're not a bad investment. We're an incredible investment. So international community, wake up and fund us, and we will be able to do all sorts of great things, which hopefully will help to save the world. Thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you very much, Guy, for a very interesting talk and some very interesting comments. Please, questions. We can start with questions from the physical audience and then ask oh, the online, online if they would have some can questions. Somebody, the online audience. Zura. Mm -hmm. ah, the microphone is coming from the top. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Don't ask you... a nasty question. Eh? Uh, no, okay. I was planning to. But, okay. um, so you you told us, um, you convinced us uh, how useful uh, these research results will be. But the research has been going on for 10 years. Indeed. And you haven't given any examples of how existing research was already used. Was was it? And, and if, if you could give some examples of that, thanks. Well, our research on um, CO2 fertilization began in the late 1990s. Uh, we built CO2 fertilization chambers for probably one hundredth of the cost of that similar kind of research done in the States and in Europe because we didn't have any money. Um, and the results from those experiments took about five years to publish and then to build into climate dynamic global vegetation models, which are complex things. That took another five to seven years in collaboration with some key authors in Germany, people like Stephen Higgins, Simon Scheiter, and others. And those models and those predictions have helped, to, have helped us to fight the global agenda to plant trillions of trees in Africa. And uh, even Bill Gates has started to question tree planting as a means to sequester carbon. So we, with a few hundred thousand rand, maybe a couple of million rand, have fought to fend off hundreds of millions of dollars in euro investment into malmitigation. That is a return on investment which Elon Musk couldn't match. Okay? That's just one example. There are many examples like that. Research we've done in the oceans, our incredible work in the Southern Ocean, done by the Southern Ocean Climate and Carbon Observatory, which for years was the only system observing CO2 fluxes in the Southern Ocean using robots. Incredibly innovative research, a global good that our NRF and DSI had to fund. 
to the tune of 20 million rand a year. 20 million rand. That's NASA's T-bill. <laughs> it's nothing in the, global, in the global north. Nothing. It's chicken feed. So, and that work has helped to identify the Southern Ocean as a critical global carbon sink that absorbs maybe 15 to 20 percent of the, of the emissions from the Northern Hemisphere mainly, and from us. We're not, we're not great on emissions, so I pick it. So there's another example. And then a, a huge amount of research has gone into um, planning uh, um, biodiversity adaptation plans, where to expand nature reserves, how to use fire to fight bush encroachment. Namibia now claims its bush encroachment number as an offset to its emissions. So it's carbon neutral, and it's now driving a whole economy on bush encroachment because it now knows that bush encroachment in Namibia is a sustainable wood source for decades to come. I could carry on. I hope I've answered sufficiently. And particularly our negotiators in the halls, as I said, the halls of battle in the UNFCCC use our results all the time. I wish they used use them all. Yeah. Gael, thank you very much for this beautiful overview of this very exciting book. Um, as you know, I'm, an, I'm a lawyer, I'm an energy lawyer, I'm a climate lawyer, an environmental lawyer, and I was wondering what elements of the studies of the finding of the model that you want to offer to the policymaker to make a change do need to overcome regulatory barriers. And just to give you an example, in the Netherlands, we're thinking about a nuclear energy again, but rather than stimulating the production of fifth generation or fourth generation plus uh, nuclear energy, we are going to look backwards to third generation uh, nuclear power plant because of regulatory barrier in the permitting system for the um, better generation nuclear energy. So how much of this new insight does need amendments and improvement of the regulatory framework for the extent that you could reflect upon now? Yeah, that is such an important question. I wish I had a lawyer by my side, but... <laughs> <laughs> Look, things are changing fast, and we don't know where things are going, but up until pretty recently, we were starting to get extremely worried about the carbon border adjustment mechanism, the CBAM. And we're still worried about it, extremely worried about it. And so farmers in the Western Cape that are producing wine, using tractors and using ESCOM power, are now moving away from ESCOM power because it's so energy intensive, install solar. That is a huge step forward in fighting against the CBAM. Um, how do we export wine? You've got to make it lighter. There's all sorts of strategies you've got to, but also, how do you manage the soil? How much carbon can you store in the soil? This kind of research really helps farmers understand that. You saw the uh, results we got for Middleburg. Are there Karoo farmers who could get millions of dollars by grazing their land in a slightly different way, achieving carbon sequestration, sustainable meat production, which we need, and uh, exports and good quality, food quality and reliable calories production here in South Africa. South Africa is one of the few countries in Africa that reliably exceeds its calorie requirements. Does the Northern Hemisphere want us to, to become a basket case? I don't think so. So this kind of science, when applied, is, it's multidisciplinary. You can apply it in so many ways. We just need the people. <laughs> We need to train more people. We've got to train a new kind of science and policymaker, people who can think across the, across the pillars. That's, and that's what this research is really trying to do, is create this new kind of thinker who can go out into society and help us. We don't have time. We're running out of time. And these are the people that are going to save the planet. We've got to produce them. And we almost produce them here. We can't rely on Northern Hemisphere expertise. We produce our own, because we have our own problems. We can apply them to Northern Hemisphere. You guys can benefit, for sure. But we have to also look after ourselves. But thanks for the question. I think it's a great question. Yeah, fantastic. Any more questions? Ah, please. Thanks, Kai. Uh, that was fascinating. I'll be downloading that book uh, <laughs> when I get back to my office. But 
I don't promise to have read all thousand pages by tomorrow. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you touched on some of the needs in that very wide-ranging talk. So, but I and I think you and you've just um, in the answer to the last question um, touched on on what is one one of part of the, what I was going to ask you about. What I wanted to ask you about is, can you just again highlight the needs for for science for the for the science on this for the next decade or so? Ah, uh, it's a lovely question. Um, what are we going to need? Sure. Well, I think that a lot of our research, uh, research in the climate space, needs to focus on implementable, attractive, and economically sustainable solutions. You spoke about nuclear. Why has it been off the table for so long? You know, did, 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 we, did we move too fast with nuclear? Of course, we know all the risks. We know them very, very well. But we're using gas as a bridge fuel. Is that such a great idea? So, so there are lots, that those sorts of needs are very important. And, as, you know, and South Africa is a leader in, these, in this area. We were the first country to do a long-term mitigation scenario process, starting, I think it was in the late 1990s, but definitely by the 2000s. So I think it produced a peak pattern decline trajectory. We were the first country to do that. Lots of countries followed suit. We led that. We are now leading in the just energy transition, the just transition, which is broader than just energy. Um, and it's, it's, it's our scientists and our thinkers who are actually closely connected to the politics. We have a huge advantage in that many of our scientists are not massively far away from political, not influence, but in, you know, informing. <laughs> We've got a presidential climate commission that knows the community, that talks to people, gets information, translates it. Um, so we, this region can, can, has already taught the world a lot. It has given gifts to the world, which they're all using. <laughs> and but what? What do we get in return? What do we get in return? We get a CBAM. Now we've got to struggle. We discover a new variant of COVID. Now we can't travel overseas. That's that's not a great return, <laughs> right? Anyway, I, it's a long. I'm weaving, as they say. I'm weaving for those of you watch certain politicians in the US. But um, <laughs> I hope I'm weaving <laughs> sensibly. Uh, yeah, so our science and policy engagement, I think, is, is, is good, and we see the hooks. We're always going to be able to see more. Scientists are often blind to the, these sorts of hooks, and we miss out on all sorts of things. So feedback, curveballs, let us adjust, let us get better all the time. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the lovely talk. Um, I think mine is, uh, you know, just couldn't help but observe how, you know, just wonderfully you've drawn from the science. It's like very science heavy, but, you know, like very well balanced with, you know, just uh, general information or well, not general, but like useful information. Um, who's the target audience here and how do you aim to get to, to that and what response would be sort of the optimum response for you? I think our primary target audience was international funders to say, this is what we're capable of. This is what we can produce. If you gave us moderate funding, we could do so much more. And that would benefit all the other beneficiaries of this book, lecturers who are trying to update their lectures with the latest information, uh, students who are turned on and want to understand their ecosystems better and get excited about doing new research here and not go overseas to you know, some boring tropical coral reef or something. There's much more exciting stuff here. <laughs> um, and then our own policymakers. Now, a policymaker, people are very dismissive of policymakers. I've spent a lot of time with policymakers and negotiators. They, they're another level. They are so clever. They are so able to read information and absorb it and turn it into useful stuff. 
uh, I think we're very dismissive. But they, they need a helping hand. So that's why the IPCC produces these very dense reports, which are incredible, but they do a summary for policymakers, which is also quite technical. Because they're talking to technical people, policymakers are technical people. I hear a lot of people complaining about IPCC. Oh, it's not talking to the people. It's not designed for that. It is designed for policymakers primarily, and that it should stay that way. Because that, this information is used in international negotiations. This information will be translated into the next IPCC assessment report. And Africa, Southern Africa, is going to have a massive new resource from which it can build an even better report. Go and read the Africa chapter of the IPCC report in Working Group 2 on impacts and adaptation. It is the best regional chapter. It's the best. And we compete against North America, South America, Asia, the East, everywhere. The African chapter is the best chapter. And it's because of this kind of science. And it's going to get even better. So, yeah. Guy, um, mm. this question actually preempted mine, but um, are you planning a summary for policymakers and what about the public? <laughs> well, this is a little outreach, a little tentative step in that direction. It is a heck of a challenge. My view about IPCC, well, okay, this is probably a little bit out there, but I think that in four years' time, when the next IPCC process gets going, we're going to be using artificial intelligence to extract information in a much more reliable way that doesn't exhaust the scientists who have to read thousands, tens of thousands of papers and can you know, end up making mistakes. So maybe we can use some semi-automated process to produce something like this. But it's so such a great idea to come up with a summary for policymakers out of this book. I hadn't thought about it. Exactly the kind of curveball I love. <laughs> Thank you for, for suggesting it. I'm sure all the other co-authors, Graham, I can see you can't wait to lead a summary for policymakers process. He, he was so full of beans after the book was finished. He needed another project. But, um, yeah, so we, yeah, we need the people to drive it. And, uh, but I, I think it's such a great idea. And a little bit of funding could be done. Could be done. Bill Gates, Prince William, <laughs> throw some money. <laughs> we'll give you a great return. <laughs> Do we have fund the scientists? Uh, please fund the scientists. Yep. Do we have questions from the online audience? Uh, yes, we have mm. one question from our online online audience. I would like to uh, just before that, I would like to welcome Mr. Helger Bodag. I see the head of education and research at the German Embassy oh, in fantastic. Pretoria. Welcome. Uh, welcome. And then Elena Cavilia is asking, thank you very much for the very nice talk. What can be done in your opinion to make citizens more aware of climate change? Well, I, I think people are very aware of it. But what, what we need to do is, is, is simplify. It's, it's too complex. Um, so the awareness needs to move from just an awareness, which tends to be a fear response, which often you know, inculcates a, a rejection. Even the word change is it's, it's scary. Um, so we, we, we need to learn a lot more about how to communicate this work. And we, you know, we want to work with, we need to work with people who are involved in communication to get the messages out in a way that changes fear into action or um, positive, you know, a, a positive view on what could happen. We need to be painting the scenarios of what could happen rather than the doom and gloom scenarios of, you know, this, this, it's going to be terrible. And I know I've done it a couple of times, but I've done it to in indicate the risk and to, to try and stimulate, you know, we, 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 not, we, we can see the whites of the eyes of climate change much better now. So we need to turn that into how fast do we need to react and how can we make things happen. It's a very, very difficult question. And I think it's, in a way, it's a little bit unfair on scientists because we've got to do all that work. And we sit with a lot of, you know, a lot of the emotional stress from the work we do. 
because we, yeah, it's very clear how much risk there is. But we've got to kind of keep going despite that. And then something like this election happens, and you go, wow. So you realize that political decisions are based not only on science. They're based on all sorts of things, how people are feeling about the economy, how they're feeling about this, that, and the next thing. <clears throat> so we've got to get more sussed about that sort of thing. But we're not the only ones. <laughs> it's a good question. Can't answer it fully. Any more questions from the online audience? Okay, then if there are no more questions, then thank you very much to Guy for the very stimulating talk. Yeah, Thank you very much to the real audience in person and to the virtual audience uh, online. And for those of